Welcome to the 2022 Taylor Lectures at Yale Divinity School. This is one of the major lecture series we offer. The Beecher Lectures are offered annually at convocation and the Schaefer and Taylor Lectures alternate every other year during the academic year. The Taylor series was created through the generosity of Rebecca Taylor in 1902, 120 years ago, in memory of her father, Nathaniel W. Taylor. Nathaniel Taylor entered Yale College in 1800 at the ripe old age of 14. While he was at Yale College, he studied theology with Timothy Dwight, the grandson of Jonathan Edwards and the president of Yale University, and even served as secretary for him. Following his graduation and later ordination, he became the minister of the first church in New Haven. Ten years after that, he was appointed to the faculty of Yale College as the Timothy Dwight Professor of Didactic Theology. We mark the beginning of Yale Divinity School as a separate unit within Yale by his appointment. The Taylor series thus carries great significance for the school and we hope for the larger world. We have certainly had outstanding theologians deliver these lectures like Sally McFaig, Jürgen Moltmann, David Tracy, and Catherine Keller, to name only a few. We are privileged to have another major figure deliver the lectures this year. To introduce this year's Taylor lecturer, I call on one of our own celebrated theologians, Professor Kathy Tanner. Well, it's wonderful to be able to introduce Graham Ward on the occasion of his first Taylor lecture on creation and grace. Professor Ward is one of the most creative theologians in the world today. That was apparent from the first book I ever read by him on Karl Barth and Derrida and the postmodern philosophy, philosophy of language. His interdisciplinary range is uh, phenomenal, spanning social ethics and uh, cultural her hermeneutics, continental postmodern philosophy, psychoanalysis, literary and media studies, and so on, the list <laughs> goes on. In this first lecture, he discusses the relationship between creaturely and divine creativity through the lens of films by Terence Malick and novels by Marilyn Robinson. I can't wait to hear what the most creative of theologians will himself say on the topic. I'd like to thank Yale Divinity School for their kind invitation to deliver the Taylor Lectures. And the opportunity has given me to present some of my more recent work. I'd also like to thank Kathy for that very generous introduction. I'm impressed myself. I just wish it had been possible for me to be with you in person, because what I enjoy so much visiting campuses like yours is talking to the students, uh, discovering what's hitting the buttons for the next generation of scholars what you're reading outside of theology, what you're involved with and why. Alas, with the pandemic, the world is entering a new kind of normal. And I don't think any of us or our futures will be unchanged by its consequences. I want to dedicate these lectures as I will dedicate the book to those working for the good in COP26. In this first lecture, I'm gonna put the theology up front because it's not something I'm gonna deal with directly in these three lectures. The indirectness itself is though theological. I have a growing sense that we need to crash through many of our theological concepts to arrive at something meaningful. Meaningful, that is, for us. We have no access to how God sees things. So we have to tell the truth slant, as Emily Dickinson understood. We have to take our inherited notions of truth, sin, love, Christ, spirit, soul, etc. And as creative artists have always known with the language of their own media, we have to push beyond them 
receiving their meaning by grace. Yes, but through a laboring that I believe is required of us and required by grace. And that laboring is just as much physical as psychological and spiritual. In fact, I don't know where the boundaries separating these domains lie. Truth is visceral, as the incarnation makes clear. It's as much concerned with blood and mucus as holiness and wonder. So the ideas in which I couch the theology I put out there do not stand freely as statues in stone and bronze. They are programmed avatars in an immersive VR game. Much theology is fighting to pin down the avatars and guess at the coding of what engineers them. So the theology then draws from scripture. All flesh shall see the salvation of God, Luke 3, 6. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made, John 3. All the earth shall worship thee and shall sing unto thee. They shall sing to thy name. Psalm 66, 4. What I'm indicating theologically here is a covenant between God and creation and an intimate relationship between God as Christ and creation that ushers in salvation. Salvation for all. For all flesh shall see it. There's a relation then between divine creativity and the creativity that governs and shapes and maintains the created world. And all flesh, human and non human, participates in that creativity. That makes you and I cosmic, planetary beings. And the fact all things are made from the stuff of stars, well, that only presents the same thing in a scientific manner. Our formation as physical, psychological and spiritual entities is inseparable from a whirlpool of composited forces, social, natural and pneumatological. And the orientation of that formation is salvation though what that salvation consists of and in, I leave open. But to me, it has to do with our belonging. That belonging is not primarily to ourselves or even to our planet as it orbits one of a trillion suns out there and more being birthed as I speak. Our belonging is primarily to the one who created us. We are just part of a covenant in which space-time morphs, folds, and fluctuates. As a mother who lost one of her sons in his youth asks, in Terrence Malick's film, Tree of Life, what are you to us? We spend our lives trying to answer that question, and even in the hour of our death, it will still confront us. There's a long sequence in Terence Malick's film, pertinent to my theme, though it caused some critics to be disgruntled when the film was first released. Into the story of an ordinary American family dealing with the death of their middle son when he was 19, a clip is inserted fast timing the story of creation from the Big Bang to dinosaurs. The clip ends with close-up shots of a human fetus. The sequence synchronizes with a theme emerging throughout the film and given pithy expression in the opening with a citation from the Hebrew scriptures. The creator speaks directly to the old man Job, where were you 
when I laid the foundations of the earth. What the clip does is relate the suburban life of one American family going through a domestic tragedy to the formation of the elements from which life arises. Their ordinary existence in a Texas town and their grief over the death of a son and a brother is given a planetary framing. Fittingly, given the bereavement theme throughout, the clip is accompanied by a beautiful soundtrack from the Polish composer Sibegniu Preisner's Requiem for a Friend, Lacrimosa. What is created by this planetary framing and the music that accompanies it is a sense of the vast creative energies out of which life on this planet issues and by which we are sustained. Alongside that, there is also in the film an elegiac sadness. Generation, development, cataclysm are interwoven and inseparable. Malik's direction, his photographer's compositions, the jump cut exchanges between characters and the music accompaniment, all create a film that broods melancholy, muted fury, meaningfulness and futility evoke meditative ripples throughout. Questions are spoken in whispered voiceovers suggestive of prayer. I've already cited the mother's, what are we to you? But then there is the elder son's soul searching. How did you come to me? In what shape? In what disguise? What plot there is follows the memories of the childhood and adolescence of Jack O'Brien, an architect, Sean Penn, in a relationship with his current partner that verges on indifference. In an elevator first going up and then descending, he ruminates on his relationship with his middle brother who died. The ruminations on death, life, creation and meaning have the quality of visions and are often referred to as such by film commentators. They propel him back to their growing up together, his teenage rebellion against an overbearing father, Brad Pitt, who gardens and plays the organ and piano, and his anger and incomprehension of his wistful spiritual mother, Jessica Chaslin. But as the voiceovers suggest, the remembrance is driven by a deep sounding, what was it you showed me? Always you were following me. To view these parents as representing nature and grace is too simplistic. Both are religious and both enjoy the givenness of the natural world. While there is a more cosmological sense in the mother's view of things, there's a more artistic sense in the father's with his love of Brahms, Bach and Schnettner. Their life in suburban Waco, where the father works as an engineer, depicts a complex weave of creation and creativity, receiving what the natural world gives and responding to it. Although Jack's life is a rejection of his weave and a rebellion against his father's authoritarianism, nevertheless becoming an architect aligns itself with his father's aesthetic sensibilities. Through the shots of both Jack's home and workplace, signs of his success, what is revealed to us is a modern sterility in which the natural world has no place. The camera just casually notes a small sapling in a concrete box on the flagged terrace of his office block. Malik's film puts out there much of what I want to explore in these lectures, 
and the book I'm writing. While Jack's outward circumstances of growing up and present day arrangements cut in and out of the plot, the focus is on his inner journey towards some small reconciliation. It's a reconciliation in the final scenes of the film, offered in the briefest of smiles and the lightest of touches. Changes in topography underscore the differences between the historical processes of growing up and losing his first home and the inward spiritual formation. Boyhood and teenage rebellion are shot in that Texas suburb of the 1950s. And the film is probably Malik's most personal to date with locations chosen in and around Waco where Malik grew up. But this is not a biography because the, film, the film's themes, the cinematography and the classical soundtrack, they all reach out towards a universal condition caught up in the seasonal changes of the natural world and the processes of growing up and growing old. They focus on a large tree in the garden and the house itself, both of which are lost when Jack's father loses his job. The topography of Jack's inner search is a rocky treeless terrain shot in Antelope Canyon, Arizona and then a coastal location where he meets up with his parents and his dead brother. Voiceovers by Jack span the two, weaving his life into the elemental, water, earth, and light particularly. The minimalism of the architecture associated with Jack is picked up in the minimalism of the desert landscape a door frame that stands isolated like some piece of Inuit rock art and the wide arc of empty sand gently washed by the sea. Just as there are landscapes and snowscapes, cloudscapes and seascapes, so there are soulscapes. There are forms forming formations continually subject to change, subject to time. Time spans and they evolve within that expansion. The deep time of rock formation and erosion is the background to the rapid movement of atmospheric pressures and air currents in cloudscapes. The endless gravitation back and forth of the tides the shifting levels of temperatures that freeze frost and melt snow, and chronologies of the soul. And these are not necessarily synchronized with growth and aging of persons. But these different temporalities intersect. They impact one upon another, and all are informed by the operations of a providential grace working in and beyond creation. The attention of what I want to call soul time is upon formation through experience, reflected absorption, attention to intuition, intimations, feelings, and imagination. Then like a salmon or a trout breaking the surface of the lake, and sending ripples in every direction, so emerges creative expression from out of soul time. These are behaviours and acts of tending, but for artists, they are enactments of those deep intersections of the natural and the social, the psychic and the biological. Our biographical experiences are the material in and through which soul time is established and shapes. Soul time is another dimension of who we are, both individually and collectively. What is basic to our experience of soul time is foraging, 
within and around us. The search for what is elusive and inscrutable. That intuition of meaningfulness and a language in which to make sense. In soul time, we struggle to find a form for the intuition that we all go through and somehow in going through it makes sense, comes together, belongs together. And this is what Jack's journeying from boyhood to adulthood and through the arid desert to an ocean gathering is all about. And out of that journeying, which models something, I think, of Malik's own journeying, the film as a collaborative art form emerges. This validation of the aesthetics of music, film, and even architecture lifts the tree of life into a soulful celebration of lived experience. It reweaves the themes of requiem, bereavement, and sterility, bringing all the jump cuts into a transformative ordering, simultaneously elegiac and healing. This is not harmony in the Greek sense of aesthetics, but it is consonance, ordered, that is, by a higher invisible rhythm of grace given and responded to. A shape emerges. It is not any final and finished form of what is grasped ultimately. Most artists look on their finished works with disappointment. The perfection they sought still eludes them and requires another reworking. So what form emerges is part of a journeying, a movement towards some intuited settlement. Even so, with Malik's film, a sense is made in which death, the accidental, broken and sustained relationships with others, employed work, the elements and creation in its planetary scale, pattern something meaningful, something incarnational. And there's nothing triumphal in its theology because it's only suggestive. Let's take this suggestiveness further, not by employing theological tropes to analyze divine providence, the operation of grace, the problematics of innocent suffering and the nature of sin, but by pursuing the relationship between the creator, creation and human creativity in another Jack and in another art form. Jack Bowton in Marilyn Robinson's novel, Jack. Plot facts. From a casual encounter, Jack has formed a relationship with a young black woman called Della. He's just out of prison, has no fixed job, no fixed abode, drinks heavily, and has a penchant for petty theft. She's a school teacher and the daughter of a black Methodist bishop. Both of them share a deep interest in literature, particularly poetry. But this is in the late 1930s, 40s America, when a relationship between a black woman and a white man was an offense that could land you in prison in certain states. And so was socially outlawed on both sides. Their first date ends in disaster. They go to a restaurant where there is some social mixing, but Jack gets picked upon and he runs out to avoid any further trouble, leaving Della to pick up the tab. Further trouble does follow once Jack is outside, but Della, safely inside the restaurant, is not exposed to it. But it's their subsequent meeting that I want to focus on and again, in part, because critics have described this as a failure of the novel, because it moves so slowly that nothing seems to happen. It's a very long opening section of the book, 
and Robinson demands a lot from her readers to stay with the writing. The writing is exceptionally fine. After a year, with Jack staying away from any contact with Della, they meet again by accident in a graveyard at night. In one of her essays, Robinson tells us, for me, at least, writing consists very largely of exploring intuition. Let's explore that intuition Robinson's writing performs in this section of the novel. It's a threefold operation. The narrator's intuition, Jack's and Della's. And it's trying to arrive at a certain judgment about and between the characters that will shape the rest of the novel. The graveyard conversation between Jack and Della has to be read slowly and give each word its weight. It's mainly composed of dialogue. And if the dialogue borders at times on banal exchanges, it is honed to a perfection that is worthy of Hemingway. The conversation has to be listened to, heard, like the Andaggio movement of a symphony. In the plot, the movement is from darkness into light, a journey through the night, with the thickness of prose taking on pellucid qualities that draw out mythic sensibilities. For example, there are hints of a Garden of Eden visited after the fall, or the garden tomb visited by Mary Magdalene before Easter dawns. The characters are uncoupled from the threatening social circumstances of their situation. A white man and a black woman alone and trespassing in a site which is closed for the night. Della had visited too long, and the cemetery gates have been locked. Jack is a vagrant, spending the night here among the other vagrants, having led his room out in town for a little money. The situation is compromising to both of them. However, innocently, to the outsider, this is an unmarried black woman and a vagrant man spending the night together. She could lose her job and reputation, and he could be imprisoned. The conversation starts tentatively, Jack noticing Della's presence in the graveyard, alert to the social dangers of talking to her, concerned for the danger she's in wandering around when there are many others like him squatting and drinking among the tombs and shadows. But increasingly, they relax into the situation that they found themselves in. They begin to walk, and as they walk, their talk takes on what might appear to be aimlessness, but in fact is delicately crafted. Della. We are not in the land of the living. We're ghosts among ghosts. They'd be jealous. The two of us out here in the sweet air, just talking for the pleasure of it. She took his arm. Yes, two spirits. Invisible. Nothing else to say about us. I mean, in terms of our measuring up to expectations. Until the last judgment, anyway. The outward man perisheth and so on. Then again, if the outward man needs a haircut, that's a problem that can be solved in theory. The inward man renewed day by day, the same blasted nuisance every time. Sometimes I wish I was just a suit of clothes and a decent shave. Uninhabited, so to speak. Everything about the easy consonants between Della and Jack is in those lines. And there's something dissonant too. Jack's scriptural citation arises as natural as breathing from Jack's memory. 
but then it's twisted by an inversion that turns us from the inward to the outward man and, and his own sense of hollowness. In this way, Jack's vagrancy becomes an expression of something far more universal, the vagrancy of not really belonging anywhere and having, like Jesus, no place to lay his head. He's not a Jesus figure, though his strangeness stalks and attracts both Della and the reader. Homelessness and vagrancy are penetrating preoccupations throughout all Robinson's books, most dramatically portrayed in housekeeping and most ironically underscored in home. But it's the exploration of intuition I want to follow here and how Robinson's prose registers the tonal qualities of the interweave of voices and relates them to the atmospheric changes from darkness to light, dusk to dawn. Her language and characterization as this couple wander among the stone cherubim and sit on the steps of a sepulchre intimates something that both transcends and subtends their circumstances. They dissolve in the cre crepuscular darkness to become more ethereal, soul speaking to soul. From another essay by Robinson. As a writer, I continually attempt to make inroads on the vast terrain of what cannot be said, or said by me at least, I seem to know by intuition a great deal that I cannot find words for. And to enlarge the field of my intuition every time I fail again to find these words. That is to say, the unnamed is overwhelmingly present and real for me. That word, intuition, again, and Robinson's exploration of it opens a realm of the unnameable. But as she rightly points out, this opening only becomes possible through attempting to make inroads on that vast terrain. That is, through the materiality of language, through word crafting and character formation, words and imagination are her tools for this exploration of intuition they enable her to make these inroads. I find this statement by Robinson quite remarkable for a novelist, because it reminds me of what Paul Salan once said in a lecture he gave on winning the George Buchner Prize for, for, of, and this is Salan speaking, the path of the impossible in which perhaps poetry travels the same path as art, towards that which is mysterious, unheimlich, and alien, friend. Of course, all novelists use words, but they use them to represent. For Robinson, in my opinion, all the arts and tricks of novel writing, plot, character, narrative techniques like flashbacks, are subservient to the power she finds in words. She uses them to perceive and probe the origins of that power. As a Protestant, I don't know if she's aware of the Christian tradition of Augustine, but she seems to perform what Augustine elaborates more discursively in De Trinitate, that in true eloquence, the word verbum resonates within our words, verba. Authentic communication within language reveals Christ as word, as the origin and source of all communication. He gathers all wording to himself. I say this recognizing there is another way of understanding Robinson's attempt to make inroads of the, on the unnameable. Such inroads are made elsewhere. They're not usually in novel writing. They're absolutely central 
to the poet's handling of language. Salan speaks of searching to articulate the absolute poem that does not exist and cannot exist and yet continually haunts. Haunts such that all true poetry attempts to speak its source and so fails. A poem then is a star that no longer shines as it shines for us now, because that shine is lost in far too many light years. But, as Salon says, each real poem, even the least pretentious, contains this inescapable question, this incredible demand. There are two points here. First, this brings poetry much closer to prayer or prophecy because there lies behind its composition an incredible demand. Secondly, the unnameable as some objective for an exploration involving language towards that which gives rise to language, well, that's usually the poet's task rather than the novelist's. It's close to song because the novel's focus is not upon representation of action, setting, character, but presentation, the fostering of a perception, even a way of seeing. It can never capture anything more than a tone, a rhythm. Hence my analogy earlier between this dialogue between Della and Jack and a symphonic movement. What is unnameable? remains an intimation, given intimately and ultimately inexpressible. Robinson, as much as Della and Jack, references the damp, the cold, the sweet air, the landscape, their clothing and their gestures. We never leave the ground. But while the outward may shiver, the inward quivers and the particular takes on a certain weight. It's so dark, Jack said. The night is so long. We'd step across a threshold of some kind, utter darkness and endless time. That would be the way of things, no more so. Sometimes I feel like we've been living on hints, seeing the world through a keyhole. That's how it would seem to us when we look back. He nodded. That's how it seems to me now. The theological aspect of intuition Robinson explores lies in that consonance between Della and Jack, which is in fact their growing love for each other. The night is long, and while these two people lose themselves among the tombstones, their racial, temperamental, and even religious differences. The darkness too takes on more disturbing associations of meaninglessness, for example. Jack is haunted by meaninglessness and suicidal thoughts. Only love and grace sustains the possibility of a new creation above the devouring nihil. As I said, I would return to the accidental nature of their meeting. In a flashback given later in the novel, we come to understand from Jack that he had told Della in their earlier meetings of his habit of roaming the streets of St. Louis at night, and particularly this graveyard. In the graveyard scene itself, Della offers some limp reason for being there so late that she gets locked in but we don't realize how limp this reasoning is until much later in the narrative. And by then we've learned much more about Della's tenacity when it comes to being with Jack. Of course, that Jack would be in the graveyard on that particular evening remains fortunate. But the accidental sets up a dialectical process throughout, throughout the novel between the mundane and divine providence, the operations of grace. 
Grace is the last word in the novel, yoked with marriage, conspiracy, and loyalty. He could consider the sweet marriage that made her a conspirator with him in it, the loyalty that always restored them both, just like grace. Predestination is not tackled head on in the novel. Though Jack's father wrestled long and hard with foreknowledge in home, and Jack tells Della he believes in predestination, while he later confesses his atheism. So predestination is part of the atmosphere Jack and Della, as the offspring of pastors and people well read in the scriptures, breathe. At no point does the third person narratorial voice of Robinson ally itself with destiny. First of all, the voice is circumscribed. It operates through Jack's consciousness, not Della's or anybody else's. And what we know of Della's motivation or other characters is through what she says, does, and gestures. That is, mostly by inference and presentation. Secondly, the nature allows the action that takes place a logic and coherence based in the characters themselves. The events are the rhythmic outworking of their inner choices, which is why the graveyard seed is so foundational, the basis for a judgment in how each of the characters will go forward. As such, when Jack is undecisive and stalls, then the plot stalls, and the other characters wait, like Della on the stoop, or Della and her family in Memphis, for Jack to act. There are two points, though, when Della does act, in coming to the graveyard where the novel opens, and in coming to Jack's room in a white men's boarding house, and waiting there until he returns from wandering the streets. Both of these events are preceded by a major caesura in their relationship. The incident in the restaurant that Della is not given any explanation for and led to Jack's year of holding himself back from seeing her, which is the background to the graveyard scene. And Della's forced return to Memphis following her aunt's arrival in St. Louis to end the relationship and a summons of a kind from her father, the background to Della's return to St. Louis and waiting in Jack's room. Both of these events have the theological quality of miracles. The relationship is terminated only then to be resurrected. The characters participate in a rhythm of salvation that attention is drawn to particularly when Della enters the white men's boarding house. The scene opens with, then something amazing happened. Jack has been pounding the streets, unable to sleep. He arrives back at the rooming house and the supercilious de desk clerk tells him a book of poetry has been left. HD's tribute to the angels. He adds a colored gull dropped it by. Jack couldn't trust his voice. I told her, you should be back pretty soon. She could wait upstairs. She's still up there for all I know. Probably. Probably a little tired of you waiting. They were laughing. The clerk said, don't worry. I probably won't call the cops. And they went on laughing. He went up to his room, and there she was, asleep on his bed, in her coat and shoes, a handbag, and her hat beside her, her lovely head on his pillow, just where he thought he knew something about the rest of his life. Well, there she was. The scene is beautifully and tenderly orchestrated. The angelic verses. The tension turned up slightly with the clerk's three probablys, 
dark streak of threat in pointing out that this liaison is illegal and the tiny details of her coat, hat, shoes and handbag, underscoring the utter urbanity of the circumstances in a prose that draws no unnecessary attention to itself. The miraculous gift of new life, born on a flow of grave grace, is sotto voce. The epiphany teeters on the edge of bathos. And there she was. It is the sheer gratuitousness of this event that strikes both the reader and Jack. Jack's own word is unfathomable, and the entire sense of it being right rests with Della's utter confidence and certainty. This is an act of entrustment, an act of faith, that can only partly be centered in Jack because Jack tells her continually, he's doomed, capricious, and untrustworthy. He has no trust or faith, especially in himself. Counterpointing a conversation Jack has been having with a Baptist minister over whether an act of faith is actually an act of presumption, Della's act lacks all sense of presuming anything about Jack or the set of social cultural circumstances in which their relationship finds itself coming to some harmonious solution. Yet writing that probes an intuition and ventures into the unnameable is presumptuous. The mystery that is Jack has to unfold in Robinson's own walk between faith and presumption. In an essay on grace, in her collection, The Givenness of Things, Robinson writes, we participate in grace in the largest sense of the word as we experience love. The essay examines the operation and expression of grace in Shakespeare. She wrote her doctoral thesis on Shakespeare. Well, what she describes in Shakespeare's writing is plenty evident in Jack. Shakespeare gives grace a scale, an aesthetic power, and a structural importance. That reach toward a greater sufficiency of expression, not a definition or a demonstration of grace, or even an objective correlative for it, but the intimation of a great reality of another order which pervades human experience, even manifests itself in human actions and relations. Now, what I would draw attention to in this observation is that recognition of a great reality of another order reaching towards a greater sufficiency of expression. We're back again with exploring intuition as it manifests itself in and through the workings of the imagination, word crafting as it tests the ground on which we all stand, searches out the source of its own power and makes inroads into the unnameable. And insofar as all her novels, especially those composing the Gilead Quartet, are about love, stirred up and shaken, thwarted, partially realized, inadequately, and often graciously expressed, then they are about grace, its intimations, and its slow movement through soul time. But while Jack finishes on grace, and there are incidents that seem fortuitous, or rather the reader is led astray from any logical possibility for their their occurrence, locked out as it is from the mind of Della. Grace doesn't operate mechanically in Robinson's novels, as in the dictates of a providence. It's more like a melodic line, almost lost in a musical variation and transposition, 
only then to re-emerge. It moves as silence mainly, as pause, as cesura, as disconnect between two thoughts. In this way, grace inhabits the rhythm of Robinson's syntax and the links between the objects observed, clothes, for example, or gestures. Her sharp focused minimalism, just as much as the thoughts, words, and habits of the characters she creates. Let me sum up what I've been saying and the direction of travel. I've been exploring a relation between divine creativity and the creativity that governs, shapes, and maintains the creative world. And I've been doing that through examining two artistic performances of that relation by the filmmaker Terence Malick and the novelist Marilyn Robinson, because their work emerges from, it's not just a representation of that relation. The forms they shape imitate the formation process itself as a response to grace given in and through the material orders. Both of them consciously work with the notion of providence. It is that which governs the meaningfulness of their labors. They make sense. And the salvation of both Jacks lies in coming to belong. In what follows in the next two lectures, we will be examining artists who do not consciously work with the notion of providence but nevertheless are responding to their immersion in two different elements. They too are making sense out of their experience of being planetary creatures. They too, I suggest, make a wager on the meaningfulness of their experience in ways which are salvific. Sing their gratitude and appreciation for creation, and work within all things that were made by him. Tomorrow, I'm going to treat rock. And the day after, I'm going to be looking at air. <laughs>